ginger, pizza, chicken, curly fries, mayo. I'm tired and my diet is going to... For full clarity, I'm actually recording this um, after the section at the end of this video, which is where I do the book review. So the, the beer is after a shift, not before, or, nor anywhere near another shift that's about to happen. Anyway, it kind of, it represents a sort of a loop in time that's, do you know what, this isn't even interesting. What is interesting is that I made a video with a friend of mine um, in Western. Here is the intro. Hi, we've come to Western Supermare, which is a place in the world. It is a place. And this is Jo Middleton. She does a blog and sometimes does a vlog about Uncle Ben's rice. <laughs> That's part of her life. Hashtag ad. Otherwise known as Slummy Single Mummy, which is one of the top, 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 top parenting blogs in the UK. That You think that might be a bit annoying. Mm. Why do you think that's annoying? Well, because nobody's going to be looking at my face. They're going to be looking at the light. Uh, you'd look at the light? Yeah. Okay. It's shiny. Shiny. <laughs> uh, we've come to Western Supermare, which as... Uh, we'll just do a quick potted history of Western Supermare right now. So Western Supermare is named after a giant horse, <laughs> which the Western section of was laid down by the Egyptians in roughly 4,000 BC. I'm not making it like the dead... <clears throat> take, take two. <laughs> Western Super, Supermare was... <laughs> And we went around Western as, as in, but we wanted to do it in kind of an absurdist way, but I couldn't get it. Once we'd done enough of the things which were kind of absurd, which here's some more of those absurd things. Where are we now? What, so we're where? heading into the ancient Egyptian town of Western Supermare. Yes, that's right, yeah. Um, named... What's what's this though? What what? How would you describe this place? Well, I guess this is a bit like um, a tomb, like a tomb. It's a tomb. Is this right. is an Egyptian tomb, and you know how the Egyptians like to take things with them for the afterlife. Yes. So, so they've taken uh, uh, a three-year-old <laughs> Kia. Uh, so so rain is the main export of Western Supermare. But what yes. what does rain do? What, what what does the other what does the world need it for? Well. Most people don't realise this, but Western Supermare is actually the only place in the world where it rains. Right. So they don't want the rest of the world to feel kind of hard done by. So sure. what happens is all the rain that falls on Western is collected and it's piped, underground pipes, to yeah. various parts of the world, um, where then it's transported up into clouds yeah. and it rains. And it's just to give people the illusion of weather. This is the world's tiniest fish bar. And for scale, at Adjo Middleton. He's this, this hot dog who's d draped in an American flag and looks to be preparing to eat himself, which is based on an ancient tradition. Not ancient, really. I mean, it's sort of Victorian tradition. As a, as a thing for the United, to show the United States eating itself on the Grand Pier. That's, that's, what, the, that's what this is. I'm not sure. I think this ride is a bit of a waste of money, to be honest. It's really hard not to hold on to the handle. It just felt like I was being unfair to Western Supermare, which, do you know what, it's just a sleepy, kind of depressed seaside town and it's all right. And we got to a point in the trip where we'd sort of done a lot of the piss taking, which I've just shown you. And we went and found a cafe and it was a nice cafe and they had like a little book swap thing going on there. and. It was all right, and we just sort of realised that the, the appeal of a place like that is the sleepiness of it. It's not the, you know, the, the slightly gaudy events or, or attractions there, but it's the sleepiness of it. And actually, you could quite easily while away the day. If, if both of us didn't have the crazy schedules that we have, I would have happily have spent the day with her there just enjoying it just enjoying the sleepy slow i'm going to say sleepy again sleepy the sleepy slow nature of it i don't know make of that what you will here's a time lapse that place by the way was called love's cafe and it's brilliant go there it's in western supermare it's called love's cafe anyway um continue on with the time lapse i guess Oh, uh, and one last thing, um, it's been a difficult week, uh, got rejected for a short story competition, which is 
do you know what? That's fine. But also, after all that smug talk I did last week about, you know, having a manager and an editor, I now just have an editor. My manager is no longer with us. Um, he's, obviously, that's the same person, but she's now only going to be editing for lots of very good reasons, OK? It's amicable and it's fine, but it's a setback. Hashtag indie writer's life. Are you, is it okay to say hashtag? Is that all right? Anyway, continue on with the time lapse. All right, off you go. Go. Well, that's not going to work, is it? Look, there's my face. <laughs> Today, I'm going to talk about this book here, which is hidden behind the steering wheel, and now it's not. It's called How I Accepted My Certain Fate, and it is an autobiography, which is a genre that I'm not a massive fan of. The reason being that the uh, essentially the two autobiographies that I've read in my entire time of reading books uh, was the uh, Richard Branson one where he is smug uh, but I only know that in retrospect I now look back on it and realize that he's smug but when I read it when I was like when I read it when I was like 16 I think I thought he was really cool and now I don't think that anymore so, and the other one was um, uh, the Anthony Kiedis's autobiography who I had a lot of respect for as an artist until I read his autobiography let me let me try to take you through what happens in Anthony Kiedis's autobiography as a theme okay so it starts out like this I was really depressed and I took loads of drugs and things weren't going well for me and then I met this woman and we fell in love and we had all this amazing sex and it was it was the best thing ever and then we split up and then I took loads of drugs and then and then I, I was really depressed and then I met this woman and she was the best thing ever and we had loads of a great sex and then and then we split up and then I took loads of drugs and I got to pretty you get the idea you don't really get any insight into the the songwriting process uh, although he does talk about when he records there's definitely oh, at one point by the way in Anthony Kiedis's autobiography he definitely has some kind of sexual encounter with Cher I'm or at least it's heavily it's heavily kind of hinted upon I don't know why nobody speaks about that but there we are so anyway, uh, I don't really like autobiographies because the, both of those you don't really get any idea of what the, you know, it's just about stuff that happens in their life. Whereas in this, this, there are transcripts of Stuart Lee's stand-up, which means that you get an insight, and, and it's all footnoted as well, which I love a good footnote. Uh, so you get this, uh, here we go, look, uh, this is... This is him talking, this is the, the transcript, this is the transcript, and then here is the footnote. You can see it's in a half size point. And then sometimes the, the footnotes, are like that, see that, that's all, that's all footnote. I, I know it's ridiculous, but it, it gives me joy. Also, you have to have two, you have to have two bookmarks because this is there's appendix at the back as well so this is where I am and this is the appendix it, it, it's an autobiography in that it tells us how he got to where he is through life events etc stuff that's happened to him some good some bad uh, mostly bad but it, it, it what it really is is it's, is it's a pulling apart of the art of what he does the art of stand-up and he has uh, as a result of being a very well studied man who knows what he's talking about which is something which i really admire in in anybody who does anything if you really know about your subject that you that you love he he it's encyclopedia he has an encyclopedic knowledge of so that there's there's histories of jokes in there there's the there's a classic joke in there which is which is by a friend of, a comedian friend of his which he thinks was by a friend of comedian of his that ends up being ripped off by joe pasquale so that there's a whole story about this 
about the etymology, in fact, of this joke and where it went and who said it and why they said it and, and actually how that changes the context and also how comedy used to be and what it is now and what the alternative comedy scene means with regard to the mainstream comedy scene. Yes, uh, as you can tell, it's, um, it's interesting stuff. It's really good. And also, I really admire Stuart Lee. I think he's really good and I think that he... I think that he's often, he's sacrificed parts of his career to say good things as opposed to saying what we expect or what might get the best laugh. Um, and I, I think that he is, I think he's a type of, I think he's like Charlie Brooker, I think he's a moral detective, which is a, a phrase I'm nicking from Nerdwriter, by the way, who is a YouTube channel you should definitely go and check out, Nerdwriter. Nerdwriter refers to Louis C.K. as... Uh, Louis C.K. is another stand-up, an American stand-up comedian, uh, go and check him out, uh, as a moral detective. And what he's kind of saying about that is he's saying that he's consistent... He, he picks up on certain squeamishness problems that we have within our society to do with humour and to do with lines that you can or can't cross. And he kind of, he, he, he has a good old close look at them using the audience to have a look at those by saying them to an audience and getting an uncomfortable response, but also kind of working out what it is that we find that's a really valuable thing in society. Don't you think that? I think that. Especially now where the news is, all the news is now is you, uh, this is some news. Here's someone who really agrees with it and here's someone who really disagrees with it. That's the news now. That's what happens. It's just ones or zeros, black and white. There's no, there's no middle ground. We're not, we're not investigating things anymore. We're not thinking about them. So am I saying that this book is the answer to all of the West problems? Maybe I am. I don't think I am, but maybe I am. So as usual, the last word goes to Stuart Lee, and I just <clears throat> here he is describing the joke that I kind of was alluding to earlier on, the joke, the one that ended up Joe, Joe Pasquale ripping off, uh, which the book is, you know, it's legally vetted. Obviously, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know whether he ripped it off or not. Maybe he did. It is 1988 in some underground, underlit London com comedy club. A prematurely aged Irishman stands on stage, dressed in a shabby long brown mac, all bloodhound eyes and droopy Wild West moustache, and utters another in a beautifully understated seam of immaculate one-liners. A lot of people say to me, Hey you! He pauses, makes an almost imperceptibly small gesture of dismissal. Dismissal. What are you doing in my garden? The audience takes a couple of seconds to catch up and then dissolves into hysterics. The man is Michael Redmond. The joke defines him perfectly as an odd outsider character and hints at a host of other weird situations as yet unrealised. For once, the audience is made to use its imagination. There are no clues or helpful pointers. The line has little in common with most of the material or the other alternative stand-up comedians of the time. It doesn't ask us to share an experience or when three of, us, when three of the same bus came at once. It doesn't contain any easy cultural signifiers such as references to 1970s television or the forgotten playground rituals and newsagent confectionery of childhood. It isn't about anything. The everyday phrase, hey you, is disrupted and made bizarre by being followed by the unexpected, what are you doing in my garden? It is, to invoke an air-wasted phrase, a moment of pure comic genius. Of course, appearing in print does no justice to it. It relies on the nuances of performance. And that, boys and girls, is why I write. Yeah, I'll see you another time, yeah? Cheers.